right, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's digital doc. Again, welcome to all of those who are joining from wherever you are. Thank you for taking the time to learn about food is fuel, how to make healthy choices to sustain energy and productivity throughout the workday. I am Dr. Santor, and I'm going to be leading this discussion today. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you before the end of the week. The recording for this webinar will also be posted on the Aligned Modern Health website. And that's where all of the recordings are from previous digital docs, if you would like to view those too. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A feature, and I'll be sure to take time to answer them at the end. It's okay to type in the chat if you want to chat with each other, but I will be answering questions from the Q&A. So let's get started. Before we talk about today's topic, I'd love to give you a brief introduction about Aligned Modern Health. But Aligned Modern Health is Chicagoland's top-rated integrative medicine and alternative healthcare clinic. We aim to get to the root causes of why you're feeling the way you're feeling. So we look at each patient as an individual, not just looking at their symptoms or conditions, but their previous history, current health history, family history, all of that information. I join you here today from the functional medicine and clinical nutrition team, which is a great way to look internally to determine why you're feeling the way you're feeling externally. All of these practices that you see on this slide are under the roof of Aligned Modern Health. I can attest to their effectiveness. I've been a patient of all of these. And you're gonna see various symptoms or conditions that each of these practices help to manage. This isn't an exhaustive list for any of them. And there is overlap between the different modalities here. So if you're experiencing any of these or anything else, we'd love to see how we can help you. A little bit about me. Again, I'm Dr. Carrie Santor. I'm a licensed chiropractor and a certified functional medicine practitioner. You can see some of the other educational experiences that I've had as well. Functional medicine isn't my first career, but all of the careers that I have pursued has been in some sort of helping profession. And for me, my specialty is focusing on lifestyle and nutrition education while using more of a mind-body approach and functional and holistic principles to help people achieve, maintain, and optimize their overall health and well-being. So the primary goals that we're gonna be achieving today mainly talking about food and how to prevent that post-lunch energy dip that a lot of us feel and experience. And in terms of food, these are the ways we're gonna accomplish these goals. We're gonna talk about how to structure a meal that will help keep you satiated so that you're more productive during the day and you have energy that lasts. We're also gonna talk about how to spot hidden culprits on food labels, because there are plenty of them out there today. We're also gonna discuss how you can snack for sustained energy, and that understanding how we eat is just as important as what we eat. And can't really talk about food without including beverages, namely water. So it's all about hydration, and we're gonna talk about that as well. First, in, when we're looking at preventing the post-lunch energy dip, it's good to get an idea of what your plate may look like. And we understand that you may not always be eating from a plate, so that's why plate is in quotes there. So we're gonna have a nice visual here though that'll help you when you're structuring any meal or even a snack. So we have our plate here and we have different ratios or percentages. So let's talk about the largest part here, which is the 50%. Ideally, 50% of your meal would come from non-starchy vegetables. Things like cucumbers, celery, asparagus, peppers, zucchini, green leafy vegetables like spinach or kale, and lettuce. So those are all good things to incorporate in each meal. Then when we look at this 25% here, we're talking about proteins. 
So for you omnivores out there, that may include things like pastured eggs, pastured chicken, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, and wild-caught fish, just to name a few. And the descriptors I used are things you're going to want to look for when you're purchasing these items. For those of you who are vegetarian or vegan, or you just want to include more plant-based protein options, there are several out there. One of them being NATO, which is a fermented soybean. There's also spirulina, which is an algae, and that had some protein included. Tempeh is an Indonesian soybean. There's also things like pumpkin seeds and hemp seeds that have a little bit higher protein content than other nuts and seeds. Amaranth is an ancient grain. Um, quinoa is also has is a grain, but also has some protein included too. Beans and lentils are great sources of plant-based protein. And if you've ever heard of teff, this is a gluten-free grain that is used in places like India, Australia, and even here in the US. Another uh, possible plant-based protein option are protein shakes. If you're like me and you like to start your morning with a protein shake, you can really make them pretty nourishing so that they are satiating and keep you full and energized throughout the day. So before I get to the last 25% of that plate, I just wanna share a few options that I personally enjoy if you're looking for brand recommendations. One of my go-tos is called Truvani. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but I love Truvani protein powders, very minimal ingredients. Um, this one is vanilla chai. It's one of their newer flavors. I think they recently came out with a pumpkin spice variety too. We're heading into fall, or I guess we are in the fall. So if you love your pumpkin spice, I believe they have that now too. So very minimal ingredients. I can read the ingredients are not tough to pronounce and I know what those ingredients are. So that's a good option. One of my other favorites is Sprout Living Simple. This is happens to be their pumpkin. What I love about Sprout Living Simple is it's just the one ingredient. So with that being said, there's no taste or flavor to it. So you, most people prefer to add something to it um, if you want some added flavor. And then one of my other go-tos is this Ancient Nutrition Bone Broth Protein Powder. I love it because not only am I getting protein and other nutrients, but you're getting bone broth, which is very healing to the gut and helps to reduce inflammation. So those are just a few I wanted to share. Next up, the other 25% is other. So these are things like your starches, your grains, carbohydrates, fruits, et cetera. So this is where you would maybe wanna put some starchy vegetables if you like things like potatoes, either white or sweet potatoes, things like beets or squash or turnips. And then some of the plant-based protein options that I mentioned could also account for this category too in the grains like your quinoa and your amaranth and teff. So some of these things do overlap. Then we have over here, this one tablespoon side of healthy fats. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you incorporate healthy fats in each meal and snack. So some of your protein options will include some fat. So again, there is some overlap here. Any nuts or seeds are gonna have probably more fat content than protein, but there will be some protein content included. Also things like avocados are a great source of healthy fat. Some other sources are things like coconut oil, MCT oil, avocado oil, and extra virgin olive oil. And in terms of MCT oil, I'd like to share another brand that I love. Firstly, I typically use Nutiva MCT oil, and I usually put this in my protein shake as at least one healthy fat source. Um, I'm also subscribed to Thrive Market, and I'll use their MCT oil as well. Pro tip, as I kind of alluded to when we first started this slide, a meal isn't always going to neatly fit into a plate setting, but try and use these same percentages when you're building a bowl, a sandwich, a wrap, or even a protein shake. All right, now that we've got the plate determined and the different percentages, let's practice at Chipotle so we can help prevent that post-lunch energy dip. So if you don't bring your lunch with you to work, or maybe you work from home and you don't feel like making anything, the tendency is to lean on fast, casual dining options. 
So as you can see in this first row here, here are their protein options. And they do have a plant-based option, the sofritas. They also have black beans and pinto beans. So that would hopefully account for more like 25%. And then your non-starchy vegetables here, you could add more of the salsas that they have, maybe the fajita veggies and the romaine lettuce. And then this second row here is going to include the 25% or other with the rice or the tortillas. So it may seem difficult to follow the plate ratio, but at a place like Chipotle, you can determine how much of what you want of each thing. So as I mentioned, to get more starchy vegetables, including more of the salsa and the fajita veggies and lettuce and minimizing the second row here with the rice or tortillas. Now for me, I tend to bring my own or maybe use my own. So I may not even opt to get the rice or the tortilla chips and use a brand called Siete. Siete has gluten-free, grain-free, corn-free tortilla chips and wraps, and they taste great too, which is always a bonus. Now you'll want to limit things like sour cream, cheese, and queso. I know that's uh, not what everyone wants to hear maybe, uh, especially me. I love me some good queso, but those three would fall in the other category just as an FYI. All right, next, when we're talking about preventing the post-lunch energy dip, we wanna take a look at food labels because there are often hidden ingredients in there that we're not really familiar with and we don't know what they mean. So let's talk about some of those. But first, let's talk about energy in the body in general. So the energy in our body is produced by something called the mitochondria. It's the powerhouse of the cell. These are little microscopic energy factories inside of the cells and adults make trillions of these. So for every second that goes by, our bodies are making 2 billion of them. And they need a lot of fuel to work well for us. Unfortunately, there are things that drain them and clog them up, and the things listed on this slide here are some examples. So the first one there being natural flavors. So this term is unregulated, and it really can mean anything. So whatever they're using may start as something natural, but after it's been processed, it's anything but natural. Next up are food dyes. And food dyes have been shown in the literature to contribute to various types of cancers. The next one is hydrogenated oils. Hydrogenation creates trans fats. Trans fats are created by adding hydrogen to liquid vegetable oils to make them more solid. And you'll often see these used in fried and processed foods. And hydrogenated oils and the consumption of them can lead to things like cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome. HFCS stands for high fructose corn syrup. So even though it may start as corn, which is pretty healthy for us, um, it's not anything near corn after it's processed. And this can contribute to things like weight gain, diabetes, and blood pressure issues. The next one down, artificial sugars. And you can see some of the names that will appear on a food label if there is an artificial sweetener or sugar added. These are known carcinogens, which means they can contribute to the formation of cancer. So even if the front of the label says no sugar added or sugar free, you want to turn that package around and look at the ingredients because you'll likely see one of these artificial sweeteners included. MSG stands for monosodium glutamate. There are a few other names that you may see on a food label like modified yeast or maltodextrin. And this is a neurotoxin, which means it can impact your brain and cognitive function. Nitrates tend to be found in deli meats and hot dogs. I know we just came off the summer months, so maybe you won't be eating hot dogs anytime soon, but nitrates have been shown to contribute to things like diabetes and cancer. And then the last one on that list is potassium benzoate, also known as sodium benzoate, and it is a preservative. And this is a major depleter of energy and can do damage to the mitochondria that I referenced earlier. So the absolute best label is something that has words or ingredients that you can pronounce and you know what that ingredient is. 
Better yet, it's a natural food that doesn't even need a label, like fruits and vegetables. And even with fruits and vegetables, you'll want to pay attention to the sticker that's on that fruit or vegetable. If it starts with a nine, then it's organic, meaning that there haven't been the pesticides sprayed on those crops. If it starts, if that number starts with a three or a four, then they're more conventional. So you'll want to avoid those if possible. There are a few apps and resources that I love to help me determine whether something is healthy or not. If any of you are on TikTok and you follow Flav City, you might already know about the Bobby Approved app, but you can download that app for free and scan things in your home or when you're out shopping and it'll let you know which things are healthy by his standards and he'll let you know why. So he'll go through each ingredient and let you know if something is healthy and if it isn't, why it's not. Another great resource is the Environmental Working Group. And Align Modern Health does not have a paid partnership with the Environmental Working Group, but this is an, another app or resource that I highly recommend to patients. Now, you can use the website. It can be overwhelming though, so I usually recommend to download the app that is also free to use. And it basically scores food and beauty products, kind of similar to the Bobby Approved app, a little different though. Um, but if you're unable to scan something, try typing it in the search box on the app because sometimes when I scan things, it doesn't come up. But when I search it by typing it in, it does. So let's take a look at the Lara Bar, which again, no sponsorship from Lara Bar, just kind of pulled an example here. So you can see what you'll notice when you use the Environmental Working Group app. You could search thousands of food and beauty products on there and find their scoring based on the ingredients, nutrition, and processing. So on the app, when you scan or type in the Lara bar here, you'll see the ingredients here, which I'm okay with these. I can pronounce everything and I recognize what those ingredients are. And then it'll also give you the findings and you'll see the little green plus sign here. It's certified organic. So the green things are good or what we might think green might mean. And then if there's red, it'll kind of tell you a warning. So again, this is through the environmental working group. And when we're eating healthier foods, again, this is gonna help to sustain our energy throughout the day. So we don't get that post lunch energy dip. They're also gonna provide you with a score. So I would say that a score between one and four is acceptable. Anything above that and it goes up to a 10 is a higher concern. And the higher the concern, the more findings that you'll see on their website. And they'll also give you an explanation of why something may be healthy or not. So in terms of the Lara bar, if you're concerned about the sugar content and maybe saturated fat, you may want to avoid this product. However, like I said, a score between one and four is Dr. Carey approved. Now I will point out things like Twinkies and Flaming Hot Cheetos are a 10. I maybe didn't need to say that, but they are. So just, just make sure that you're educated and informed about what you're putting into your body and eat those things in moderation or minimize. All right, next on the list, how to snack for sustained energy. So we want to make sure that your blood sugar is regulated throughout the day, and you can accomplish this by choosing foods and snacks that are rich in things like fiber and healthy fats. Ideally, whole minimally processed foods are going to be ideal, and here are some examples of higher fiber foods and healthy fats, some of which I've mentioned already, and then some other foods here and herbs and spices that can help to regulate your blood sugar. And I understand that many people start to feel an energy dip around two to three in the afternoon. And it may be easy to grab something like a candy bar or potato chips, maybe even pour another cup of coffee or get an energy drink. But these foods mentioned here are great alternatives that are, are ideal for regaining and sustaining your energy while also helping to regulate your blood sugar. So more recently, I came across this by Harvest Roast, and these are pumpkin seeds. Can you tell I like pumpkin? And these have garlic herb in them, so they're great. And what I like about this is they don't even use oils. 
in this. It's just pumpkin seeds and then the different seasonings that they use. So if I need a quick snack, I may grab something like this. As I mentioned before, I have a subscription to Thrive Market and I may snack on something like these nuts here as, as part of my snack anyways, but these are organic pecans and I will get other varieties of nuts and seeds through them or Whole Foods or even Trader Joe's. All right, continuing on with how to snack for sustained energy at work or even when you're on the go. So you'll wanna combine at least two of the macronutrients in each meal and even snack, as we're talking about snacks that you have. So macronutrients in includes things like carbohydrates, proteins, and healthy fats. So here are some examples here. So we've got a quarter cup of unseasoned raw nuts, that would be your healthy fat. And you can pair that with say two ounces of, of organic jerky, which would be your protein. And I love giving a good brand recommendation. If you like the jerky, I like the chomps. And of course, me being the Italian that I am, I like their Italian style beef stick. Uh, these are grass fed and grass finished, which I look for if I'm gonna consume beef. So there's an option to consider. There are a lot of bars out there and you just wanna be careful and mindful of the ingredients. So bars though, some really good ones will have a good combination of protein, carbs, and healthy fats to help keep it balanced. And the two that I recommend are the RX bars and the Epic bars, as you can see pictured there, and even Hep Hearts. Next there is we have an apple, which would count for your carbohydrate. Pairing it with say two tablespoons of a nut butter of your choice, which would be your healthy fat. So again, the apple alone being a carb is high in natural sugar, which I would rather see you have an apple versus a candy bar, but having the apple alone could cause your blood sugar to spike and then drop. So when we combine it with another macronutrient like a healthy fat, like, a, like this nut butter here, this helps to regulate your blood sugar better. So the recommended nut butter there, as you can see, Artisana, I've used that brand before and I like it. Justin's is another good brand. One of my personal favorites though is by Trader Joe's. They have this organic creamy peanut butter. I don't like the salt added, but if you want some salt added, go for it. But the only thing in this is organic Valencia peanuts. So I'm a big fan of this one. Another example there, we have 15 olives, which would be a healthy fat. And you can pair that with one cup of raw vegetables, which would be a carbohydrate. And lastly, we have one cup of guacamole, which would be healthy fat. And you compare that with say a cup of raw veggies, that would be a carbohydrate or two ounces of say grilled chicken, and that could be a protein. All right, next, when we're talking about preventing that post-lunch energy dip, how we eat is just as important as what we eat. So we've done a lot of talking about what we can eat. Now let's talk about how we eat. So you'll wanna be mindful and put the brakes on how fast you're eating. Hopefully you can get away from your desk during your lunch hour, but I understand for some people that it's not possible. But at least if you are eating at a slower pace and minimizing distractions, that's gonna be very beneficial. So you'll wanna avoid doing things like talking on the phone, turn off that television, put the electronic devices down in general, and um, being aware of your surroundings can really improve meal time because ideally it would be a pleasurable experience, but often we see it as a burden, just something we've got to do before we get back to work or get back to whatever we're doing. So it's important to slow down the pace and minimize distractions as best as possible. Now the extra blood flow and oxygen you get from taking a walk shortly after eating can help not only digest your food better, but you will also perform better mentally and can lead to increased productivity later in the day. So after you eat, taking a, a 10 minute walk, get some fresh air, and you'll likely be more productive when you get back at the work that you need to do. Now, a survey by this workplace consulting group, Right Management, found that only one in five people report taking an actual lunch break away from their desk. But even just doing a 10 to 15 to 20 minute break, um, more so the 15 to 20 minute break, but then maybe even walking 10 minutes after eating 
was proven way to help sustain concentration and energy levels throughout the day. Now, a study from MIT found that office workers who socialize tend to be around 10% more productive than those who don't. So hint, hint, wink, wink. You can share this with your boss. I will not be writing any doctor's notes to allow you to socialize at work, but if you wanna find this study and share that with your boss, um, hopefully they will be open to some socializing. Now, for those of you who are working remotely, when it's your lunchtime, you could maybe set up a FaceTime with your friend who has the same lunchtime or your mom or your dad or another loved one. And then maybe taking a walk after work with your dog um, to help with that digestion process or just walking around the block by yourself or a neighbor or a friend just to get some deep abdominal fresh air breaths. It's really going to help you tackle the rest of the day. All right, mindful eating continued. So when we eat mindfully, and again, that means at a slower pace and minimizing distractions, this tends to lead to less impulsive eating. So you're only gonna end up eating when you actually feel hungry. I don't know if any of you ever eat out of boredom. I'm guilty as charged at times. So when we slow things down and we're more mindful about what we're doing, we'll likely eat when we're hungry versus just because. It also tends to reduce empty calorie consumption. So eating things that really aren't going to serve you and that you don't really need to be eating. You're also likely to make healthier snack choices and your body will be better trained to prefer healthy foods versus the not so healthy foods. You'll also be better at cognitive restraint. So you'll be mindful of knowing that when you are full, when you've had enough to eat, when we eat, when we're at our desk and we're working or we're on the phone, we're not really paying attention to the cues that we are full and we may overeat. And then when we're eating more mindfully, this can contribute to weight loss efforts and also helps to combat disordered eating patterns like binge eating. There are additional resources, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, that I would encourage you to take a look at. That first one there called the raisin exercise. If anyone's like me and doesn't really care for raisins, you can use a different food, like say an almond. And essentially what it's suggesting you do is to go through each of your senses one at a time with that food before you eat it. That way you are being more mindful about what you're eating before you physically eat it. And then the Discover Mindful Eating is a great book to read and then those last two there, there are websites there that you can access those resources to help create that habit of mindful eating. I mentioned in the beginning, we were also gonna talk about beverages. Hydration is super important. So again, not just about what you eat and how you eat, but the amount of water that you're drinking each day. So the goal that we typically recommend for our patients is to drink about half of your body weight in fluid ounces of plain fresh water each day. You can flavor your water with some fresh fruit or herbs. That's perfectly fine. Just be careful of the different flavoring drops and powders that they have out there because a lot of times they add artificial sweeteners, maybe even colors to them. Herbal teas do count towards that daily goal. Coffee or really anything that has caffeine in it is gonna count against the goal. So let's say your goal is to drink 100 fluid ounces of fresh water and you end up consuming 12 ounces or more of regular coffee that day. We'll stick with the 12 though. Your new goal would be 112 fluid ounces of water that day. Now your goal may be increased too if you are active and you're exercising consistently or it's hotter outside, which we're getting closer to the colder temperatures, unfortunately. But keep that in mind during those moments, you'll wanna get more water in. I do recommend limit sparkling water to one per day. Some brands that I recommend are Spindrift and the Mountain Valley. Um, so sparkling water can be detrimental to the enamel on your teeth. Your body may not digest carbonation as well too. Now, if you're someone who drinks a lot of pop or soda, I know that's a term preference depending on where everyone is from, sparkling water can be a great gateway. So occasional consumption is fine by me. 
And then I do recommend consuming beverages and even your food from glass or stainless steel, especially more so when you're on the go, um, over plastic. So I would even ditch the BPA-free kind with the plastic just because it's BPA-free. It usually means that there's another chemical in there called BPS, which isn't any better from what I've read. So I just ditch plastic whenever possible. So in terms of water, I know I already mentioned with the sparkling water that I like the Mountain Valley, but this is their spring water, but they do have a few sparkling water options, but this comes in a green glass bottle. And then one of my other favorites is Starkey. This also comes in a glass bottle. And then, like I mentioned, when it comes to food storage containers, again, glass or stainless steel. All right, that is all the information that I have for you today. Thank you again for joining us. I will be answering questions now, so feel free to type them in the Q&A feature and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if you'd like to schedule a personalized free 15 minute consultation with Align Modern Health, the phone number is here and you can also go on the website and schedule that too. We'd love to help you out in any way that we can. Okay, so we have one question already. Um, is mineral sparkling water any better than regular sparkling water? I've heard mixed things about, about that. So I still limit the amount of overall sparkling water that I will consume, and that's my personal thing. So again, I would say mineral sparkling water on occasion. That's a great question. Any other questions, feel free to type them in. I think I got to most of my brand recommendations that I wanted to share today, but while I'm waiting for other questions, Take a look. I think I covered everything. Yeah. Okay, here's a great question. Have you used the Yuka app? So this person has it and just downloaded the Bobby approved app and feels that the Bobby approved app is better. So that's great feedback. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to put myself on blast here. I have the Yuka app, but I have not used it much. So although I am familiar with it, likely not as familiar as you. So I appreciate you reminding me about it, but I'm glad that it seems like the Bobby approved app seems to be a good app because I've used that more frequently. All right, we've got another question here. How many calories do you recommend having in snacks? So I personally don't focus on number of calories. I focus more on that ratio, like I showed you with that plate, and just making sure that I'm getting a good amount of protein, carbohydrates, healthy fats, fiber in each meal. And even for snacks, I try to do that too. But sometimes it's harder with snacks to get all the ratios figured out, especially when you're on the go. So as long as I pair two macronutrients together, that's more of what I'm looking at versus total calories. Thank you for asking that. We've got another question here. I'm asking my thoughts about intermittent fasting for people who work out. So intermittent fasting can be beneficial for people. Um, that may be more of a personal question and feel free to um, sign up for a free consult so we can get more information about your particular situation. But just in general, intermittent fasting, I'm not opposed to it. For females, I generally suggest no more than 16 hours just because it can impact hormones eventually from what I've read. Um, but with working out, you want to just with fasting in general, I won't even uh, specify to just people who work out. When you are fasting, you still wanna make sure that you're eating as though you were eating during a full day in that shortened window. So just because you're fasting doesn't necessarily mean you eat less. Good question. Okay, 
And another question that came through, what are my thoughts regarding consuming eggs? Is it okay to have the whole white and yolk? How many eggs a day are considered healthy? So I do consume eggs. I know there's been a lot of information for and against them. I do think eggs are healthy. I would look for pasture raised eggs. I do eat the whole egg. And um, the number of eggs a day, I mean, personally, I'll usually do one, one to two at the most. Uh, so that's my personal thing, but everyone is different. So depending on your background, your current health status and labs, because we do run labs on people, we could determine what may be a healthy amount for you. So feel free to sign up for a free consult so we can get to know you better. Okay, this next question that came through, do you recommend that ratio for both lunch and dinner or should it be lighter for dinner, for example? So the size of the plate can vary between meal to meal. So I know the plate on the screen looks really big. So let's say that you do tend to do better with a lighter dinner. Then you would be eating potentially from a smaller plate, which would mean that the amount of food overall would be less but still half of that smaller plate would ideally come from starchy vegetables or non -star I'm sorry, non-starchy vegetables. And then 25% of that smaller plate would be protein, 25% would be the other. So I hope that makes sense, but let me know if I need to clarify further. Any other questions for today? These were great questions. All right. All right. I don't see any more questions coming through. I want to thank you all again for taking the time to join us today. And you, like I said, you will get this recording so you can rewatch it. And please feel free to sign up for a free consult so we can see how we can serve you. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Take care.